Hi folks, welcome to Wednesday's edition because it was PMQ, so it must be Wednesday's edition of uh, the iWrite Radio podcast stroke videocast. I've got uh, Stuart Lockhead and Jimmy Hutton with me, and I'm Norris Stewart. We're going to have a chat about Nicola Sturgeon's press conference. We're going to have a chat about PMQs, which is kind of Boris Johnson's press conference, I suppose, <laughs> only he doesn't answer any questions. And we're going to have a wee chat about the list indie party idea. Um, I think we've got three different opinions on this between us. It might be quite interesting to see what comes out of that. Um, let's start with PMQs. Uh, I suppose the first question is, how did Kerr Starmers do this week? Stuart, you have a pop in. Um, I think he's right up Boris Johnson's backside today. He made uh, Keir Starmer made Boris Johnson look good. Oh, I mean, how did he manage that? Was he out last night? Was he on the baby? Absolutely useless. Uh, I mean, it's shocking. What well, was his first joke. question? Well, he asked about, um, well, he, he's obviously got the care homes. What would he ask about? Tell me a lie. Uh, yes, the care homes, death. Was it basically after the comment by Johnson that looked like he was blaming care home workers for the death yeah. of the care homes? He asked for an apology. Now, Boris Johnson knew that was coming. He was well prepared for that. Keir Starmer wasn't well prepared for, for he, he should have had, if it, you know, an, an algorithm. Boris is that, you say that, but he did, he, he did nothing. He just flow chart. Plund, he plundered on. Um, and at one point, it was only after the second answer by the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister claimed like he did, he used the word massively, and you know, it's tremendous. As soon as he uses one of these stupid object, adjectives, he, he's going to say something stupid. And he said, oh, we've been investing massively in care homes. Now, Keir Starmer totally ignored that, which it was a clear lie, and he could have said so, but no, no, he just wandered on. He was terrible. Be interested to see if that's going to be pulled for an explanation in what is it they call the record at Westminster? Hansard. Hansard. All right. <coughs> um, just... Because that it must be demonstrably untrue. I mean, they gave no. them PPE, I suppose, but invested in? Uh, that, that's, that's a get out, mate. They handed them millions of pounds of PPE, so that can be said as an investment, can it? So I, I'm presuming that you weren't particularly impressed with the Labour leader either, James? No, I mean, he, he asked for an apology he wasn't going to get, but what he got for Boris Johnson in the first answer was, I accept full responsibility for what happened. So at that point, you, you nail him with, I accept full responsibility. What do you accept responsibility for and why are you going to change it? But he didn't, he, and he, he just babbled on. And then he, he, to the point where he's gave Boris a free pass today. He's made, like Stuart says, he's made Boris look good. And then he hits him with car parking, which he probably should have went in the first place, given that it's a particularly heinous action by the Tory party to make NHS workers start paying for their car parking again quite so soon, particularly how hard they're still working down in England. But this is, this, that was a question, I presume, on the back of PMQs that was asked at the Nicola Sturgeon presser. Um, would the free parking for staff, well, for everybody as it happens, at the PFI hospitals continue? Um, I'd, I'd kind of like to make a point here and um, put my hands up. My wife works in the NHS in Edinburgh. Um, and one of the benefits of the free parking that's never been mentioned is the safety element. My wife can drive to work. She doesn't have to get on public transport. Um, she doesn't have to wear a mask. You know, I wonder how many people have been saved from catching COVID who work in the NHS because they haven't had to use public transport because they've had free parking. Mm. I don't know how big uh, an, a thing it could have been, but it's an interesting thing to think about. I don't know if there's any stats on spread on public transport of, of COVID. Um, I, I don't think they've broken it down that far as yet, but certainly there must have been spread on buses because it's just not a very hospitable environment. You can yourself 
how soggy and damp the interior of a bus gets on a wet day. Aye. So Aye. the amount of people that would have had to travel on buses and could have taken COVID in to hospital with them. Yeah. Yep. It's I'm, definitely a good point, mate. It, I'm <clears> just, I've never heard it mentioned as a safety issue for the staff. Um, I've only ever heard it as a wee kind of giveaway for them. Um, what else came up at... Ian Blackford. You weren't well, impressed, I take it. No, he was worse than ever. Um, what, did, what did he talk about? He did make That should be his resignation. That should, that should, that should, be, he should just be gone at that point. It, he, asked for, useless. he asked for furlough to be continued. I mean, why would you waste a question on something like that? Which I, I admit it's important, but Rishi Sunak is standing up after yep. Boris Johnson to make a statement on the economy. So there's no danger Boris is actually going to give you any answer. And all he basically handed Boris was the opportunity once more to say, I will spend billions in Scotland, wrap it in the butcher's apron and ram it down Blackford's throat. I mean, Ian's been awful, utterly awful since he moved back to Sky and started day noise stuff via Skype or however he's doing it. It's, it's and not, as I say, it should be finished now. It's not a platform that suits him. <clears throat> I mean, I, I don't think he performs particularly well on the floor of the House of Commons either, mm. but he's, he's not performed well in front of the, the cam. Why don't we hear, before, before we move away from Ian Blackford, what do you think of his, uh, his replacement, his deputy's replacement, Kirsten Oswald? Just been elected yesterday. Was she elected? Oh. Elected by presumably the MPs at uh, the, the SNP. MP oh, I didn't realise they'd already had the election. Yes. She well, was standing. And she Who was else standing. stood? No idea. Closed. Probably, probably named me if, if they've done it this quick. <clears throat> I can't remember which one she is. I, I, mean, I, didn't, you, I didn't know a great deal about her. If you believe everything that uh, George Caravan wrote about this week, you'd believe it was a fit up at. Uh, SNP HQ. You can't believe everything that George Caravan wrote about this week, mate, as we'll get to later. <laughs> can you resist I you that? can. No, you can't. Uh, uh, can, can you resist that one? Um, <coughs> yeah, and uh, Blackford needs a bit of coaching. He needs a bit of training, at the very least. He uh, needs a new job. He's not being impressive. I mean, it's one of those things. The, the SNP is such a tight ship, you really don't know how he performs uh, behind closed doors as leader. Maybe he is an exceptional strategist or something, but he's not impressed when, when you look. I mean, he's got a high bar. I mean, because you do, you're comparing him to our Holyrood MSPs who have performed magnificently over the last three or four months. I mean, I don't think they've really put a foot wrong. Apart from Humza, mm. um, in front of the committees, the only kind of one I can think of at the moment. Um, Boris Johnson seems to have found a way to deal with Keir, Keir Stammer. He's improved week on week. Yeah, well, he couldn't do worse than he was to start with. Bear in mind, he was recovering from a, a serious illness, and apparently the evidence is more and more evidence that uh, you don't recover in a week. Mm, I will. I'm being kind to the, the laddie. Mm, I, I think he's, he's not so much found a way to deal with him as Keir Stammer, I would suggest, isn't going necessarily where he ought. I think Keir's being led by the usual Labour problem. Keir's being led by a committee. He's no... He's no ripping into Boris. He's trying to go along with this, we're in a pandemic, so I shouldn't be too political stuff, which is just ludicrous given. And, I mean, I, mean I don't know about you, but the headlines, every time I see Labour on the headlines, it's always about Jewish conspiracy or something. It's never about uh, Labour attack Johnson. I know, I, I just, he gives me the impression I, I thought him being a QC would, would be a benefit. I thought he would be forensic. But he's not actually been forensic. 
No, because he's, Boris turns it and talks to him about being a QC every week, and he's daft enough to go on the defensive about that. The fact, well, that, he's a, the fact he, that he's a trial lawyer, or he was a trial lawyer at one point, should be a massive advantage to him. Well, let's see. He, he refuses to act as a trial lawyer. But that, this idea that trial lawyers, you know, have get the gotcha moment, like on the telly, isn't it true? Trial lawyers basically do it step by step. It's incremental. They're just trying to not. get as much information. Well, he kind of is. That's my point, that where we think of QCs as being Perry Mason, you know, and here's the letter that shows you're a lying piece of shit. Showing your age there, Nori. <laughs> I think anybody that thinks lawyers are Perry Mason or, or have a gotcha moment are clowns, mate. That's what bloody TV presents them as. Anybody that's been in a court of law knows very different. But what, Ke what Keir Stammer is not doing is presenting Boris Johnson with a list of his incapabilities and asking him to explain why he's so incapable. Well, that's, that's kind of my point. My point kind of is he needs to be more like a telly lawyer and less like a real QC. He needs to find gotcha moments. He needs to wrong foot Boris, not ask the obvious question. Or not ask the obvious question as soon as he stands up. So you, Boris I, I, can be confident that the answer is already in his pocket, you know? If you want that as a leader, mate, you're as well getting bloody Andrew Neil to lead the Labour Party. And he's a Tory. He Andrew Neil is eminently qualified to lay, lead the Labour Party, is he not? Or aye. the right wing of the Labour Party, at least. <laughs> Absolutely, aye. He's got everything, even due to the horrifically bad false hair that would look wonderful in the House of Commons lighting. Okay, let's skip lightly along to the press conference then. Um, outstanding. Well, she got to slap somebody down. Stuart, you spotted oh, this. All right, no, right. Well, we've heard before, but if you haven't heard before about Barhead Travel, who told all their uh, employees they've got to vote no back in the 2014 independence referendum. And they had a planted question from somebody, one of the news, uh, <laughs> news times yesterday, I think it was, basically, because um, they threatened jobs if they didn't get um, Spain. Spanish holidays. They didn't mention Spain, but anyway, they're a travel agent, and we already possibly commented about the fact that I've certainly said as much, you know, I'd rather the money was spent in Scotland on staycations rather than the government supporting Spanish hotels. Anyway, Barhead Travel got a slap to the, when the First Minister announced her list of uh, quarantine free uh, foreign holidays. Uh, Spain uh, was accepted was removed from the, the, the approved list for England on, the ba on a very sound basis uh, that uh, there's been a turnaround in the uh, infections in Spain. So off they go. Um, I'd, I mean, anybody else want to comment about the... Well, I'd, I was bridges? kind of... I'd, I must admit I'm quite happy. Uh, I've got relations in Spain, and our first trip will probably be to Barcelona to see Jill's brother uh, when we're allowed to. But I quite, I, I quite like the fact she was prepared to say no to, to Spain, because what this is really about is not the amount of COVID in any given country the, for the English government. It's simply about getting airlines packed full again. You know, and for her to be able to stand up and say, right, I'm sorry, the rate of community infection in Spain is too high, is exactly what she should have done. It's based on the, the evidence and it's based on the health aspect of this, not the economy. Exactly what she said yesterday. It's a public health decision. Um, so, I mean, much as I'd like to go to Barcelona and see my brother-in-law, I'm happy to sit on my backside uh, and not risk my community, of whom I see very few <laughs> at the moment. Well, I mean, she, but, she, she, she's risking, I'll use the word popularity, uh, amongst quite a lot of um, West Coast, West of Scotland people. You've got a lot of them would have liked to jump on a plane to Spain, to Benidorm or somewhere. But there's also a lot of workers, Rolls-Royce, uh, Glasgow Airport, 
um, a lot of that. I think there's aircraft maintenance at Prestwick. So there's a lot of aircraft jobs involved. And yet, Aye, but she, I mean, come on, they, she, they, the list gets updated in about a week and a half. It's not like it's a it's a lifetime ban for Spaniards coming to Scotland or something like that. They'll probably be allowed to come by the end of July if their country gets a bit of a grip right. on the public health problem. So, so the question arises, is she, is she being political? Because she, said, she did actually say, uh, I'm not prepared to be a rubber stamp for England. Well, what does that mean? Well, I, I, I think, it, I think it was, it's a good move because down the line, she can point to that decision and say, look, that wasn't a popular decision. That was a decision I had to make based on the evidence public and public health. So don't accuse me of getting political. And then the rest of the, the, the there were quite a few questions about well, what ifs about uh, you know crossing borders coming from England. Would you still have to quarantine if you went from Portugal into Spain or flew back from Portugal? You, would you could you avoid quarantine? These are questions. There were quite a few like that. At the end of the day, she did say, look, circumstances could change. She more or less said, don't book a foreign holiday just now unless you're prepared to, to get stranded or quarantined. Yeah. And the other interesting thing was, as you just said, there was numerous questions about people being able to fly from and back into Manchester and then just drive up the road. Right at the very start, when she made her statement, she said, people will not be able to drive down to Manchester, fly to Spain, come back and get round quarantine because we now, because of our memorandum that everybody was a bit upset about, we will now get that information from uh, the English Health Service. Hi. So, you know, great. And they still ask the question, even though they've been told <laughs> the answer. Well, it's, it's what the army is. Who, it's who and what they are. They're there to try. I mean, some of the convolutions that they go through to get to scenarios to then ask questions on. I'm surprised she sometimes just doesn't say, Ken, what if somebody wants to go that far to get a week in Torremolinos on the self catering for 130 quid? Help mend them. I hope they get the shits when they get there enough. <laughs> and it's just a nonsense, an absolute nonsense. And, and these are people that, let's be clear, before the daily briefings went, on the telly every day. I think a lot more people had, we, we set sort of standards. We thought that the press were maybe half decent in Scotland. My God, they've fallen down in people's estimations, have they not? I'm beginning to understand why some of them write because they right. have real problems putting the, the words into a, an understandable question. Mm -hmm. Some of them was, are, You're right, it, 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 there was two obvious examples today of how they build their, their story for tomorrow's paper. Um, Peter McMahon got, got his arse felt. Again. Uh, again. Um, he came up with a story. He managed to get, you get a quote, you see. What you do is you get a Tory MP called John Lamont, and he complains about such a story that's been dragged out of a very dubious, very small local paper called the Border Telegraph. And I the quote that claimed that the Scottish government is negligent. It's about care homes. The, the, the meat and drink doesn't even matter. The First Minister said straight away, no, I just I would treat that with contempt. Mm. The accusation should just straight away. What, no, what he said was the SNP failed care homes. That there were 68 people moved out of hospitals into care homes without being tested. Um, and within that question was contained the fact that uh, the Borders Health Authority had no proof whatsoever, any evidence that any of the 68 people were infected. That's true. And nothing indicated that any of these people had been infected. It was, it was a political question. And she... Uh, Basically, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, of course, but she, 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 the guy claimed that the, the journalist claimed that John Lamont had accused the SNP of being negligent. Mm. Well, so she wasn't having it. Oh, and the, anyway. other one was, the other one was, uh, what did she say? Oh, hi, Paul Hutchin, everyone's favorite daily record editor these days, or is it just, is it just a politics section of the whole thing he, he does? Um, <laughs> again, it was the same idea. 
It was a bit of Falkirk whoa, school. Whoa, 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 whoa. Paul Hutchins didn't have a question today. Oh, no, terrible. It was Tom Martin. Or second. He, you're right. He, he got, it was Tom Martin of the Express, but uh, he, got, he got a pelt off as well. He came up with a story about Falkirk schools, which uh, the detail was they might be a bit later going full time compared to other schools. And the, the, but he had a rent a quote that, uh, that things were falling apart, was his accusation. For, I mean, it's like, you, you just write that you are the person, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it was you, John Smith, and standing outside that pub that's claimed everything was falling apart. It's rubbish. Uh, we're, still, we're still talking a school that's meant to open in uh, four and a half weeks' time or so, and things are already falling apart. Really, Mr. M I mean, seriously, it's Express. I, their chips in it. I don't even know why they bother even taking questions for them clowns anymore. I have a wee tremor in my water about this. Yes, yes. Surely not. Wait a I, I wonder if by August the 11th, the politics will be far enough back on track that certain councils decide to make the SNP government look bad by delaying openings. Falkirk has just if you like, fired the first shot on this one. They've got an inbuilt excuse. Let's have a week to get the first years, um, be that primary or secondary first years, embedded because normally they get a couple of days at school before everybody else just to see around the place and everything. Surely not. And I wonder if we might see a bit of politics played on this one. I fully well, they, expect to hear screams for more money to open on August the 11th. If they do, they better be prepared to answer to half the population who support this government, who are willing to take a wander down to the local school and ask the teachers why they're not opening. Because the teachers will be in there from what? They'll be in there a week and a half in advance of the schools reopening. I, I've got a sneaky feeling that we'll see some politics played on this one, including Cosla. Well, I can't think. Cosla is basically the Labour Party, the Labour Party, the trade union's last tranche of power that they've got left, isn't it? Yeah, true, true. <clears throat> um, anyway, she, she slapped him down big time. Uh, anyth anything else out of the presser? Not really. She fin but towards the end there, she more or less said, I get the same, she used diplomatic language to say, if you book a holiday now and you get stranded, it's your own fault. Okay, I'm going to ask you to take a wee, a wee punt here, boys. What was the phrase she didn't use that she was going to use about being annoyed? Do you think she was about to say, and anybody out there that's pissed off with me, <laughs> do you not remember? No, but I didn't know what herself. <clears throat> All right. She stopped herself using a phrase and said, I was about to say something I shouldn't there. Um, that was kind of the nicest, but least publishable. Yeah, thing I I said, she has a sense of humor, that's for sure. She does, aye. Um, right, let's move on to the kind of important article writing that's gone on in the last 24 hours. Um, who's all written articles? Oh. Ruth Wishart, Kevin McKenna. Kevin wrote today, George, yeah. George Caravan. Uh, Peter Bell's had a wee pop, not a big one. A wee oh, one. he had a quite nice one this morning. I liked his analogy this morning about the train sitting there in the station. I thought that was oh, quite well. Oh, I was bored with it by the he time. He kind of flogged it to death, I, did he not? By the, by the time I was at the bottom of the station escalator, I was pissed off and wanted to go back up to Princess Street, mate. Talk about <laughs> flogging a dead horse. <laughs> Look, at it. We, we, he writes so much because he writes every day, and some of it is padding. I, I well, it. even <laughs> even Peter admitted he might have overdone it in the. Oh, I, he, he did admit that himself. That's why I'm having a pop, mate. <laughs> I think, I think sometimes <clears throat> him and uh, we ginger Doug need to understand that analogies are supposed to simplify things, not complicate them. Hmm. Because he had us getting on and off trains and stopping at stations. And uh, I was waiting uh, for you had, to remind, you had to remind yourself who was driving the train and who was the station master. <laughs> yeah. It was, uh, anyway, can we have a pop at George Caravan? You can have a pop at George Caravan. Uh, you, you have a pop at George. Aye. 
loves the sound of his own writing, clearly, as it's particularly verbose. Um, it just reminded me of student politics at Stirling in the 80s, where you can write anything you want. The truth doesn't necessarily matter because you're wanting to come to a premise in the last paragraph. I mean, he wrote absolute nonsense about the economy in Ireland to support the assertion that he was making. Absolute pish. Um, if, if you were an Irishman, you would be, right now, you'd be stoking about East Lothian trying to find George Kerrigan and kick him up and down the street. What Absolute nonsense. What did he say, he was, Jimmy? He was talking about the Irish economy and how it was collapsing pre-COVID. Was it hell? The Irish economy had bounced back after 2008, 2010, better than any economy in Europe. And he absolutely trashed the economic strength of Ireland to support his arguments about Scotland. I've got, lot, I've got a lot of time for George. George is um, a lefty of the left and has been for many years. I was actually and quite surprised. There. Well, I was quite surprised he ended up sitting as an SMP MP. Um, I didn't really think he'd go that way, but there you are. George is uh, of that intellectual left. He was once a Labour councillor, an Edinburgh Labour councillor. Um, so he's he's been ruined the mill. He's also an economist. I'm pretty sure that's what his qualifications in. He he's like you know that intellectual group, that sort of university group of Marxists that used to float about in the sixties. He's he's of that ilk. Right, so like like uh, some people in the common wheel, you mean? Uh, great, at, great at writing about it, no, no necessarily so great about living it. I think uh, George great. George has got his hands dirty. I mean, George has has but done, as I say, the councillor's job, the MP's job. He's he's not just a talking the MP's head. MP's job, getting your hands dirty, have a word, mate. 80 grand a year and 100 well, thousand. Do you know, do you know the most the interesting the place? Planet. The most interesting place I ever met George was in a village called Tipidabo during the, um, the independence referendum in Catalonia. And he was there as one of the oversight team. All right. uh, and I'm standing at the top of this hill with a pint in my hand and who comes wandering up the road? George Caravan. And it's a steep hill. He was quite knackered, but he sort of looked at me and he went, I know you and I know you, George. <laughs> It was quite quite interesting. Two two Scots independent supporters standing outside the polling station in Tipidabo, which is on the hill above Barcelona, incidentally. I think, generally speaking, the left, the, the, the not say the extreme left, the far left, are uh, clearly fairly poor on long term strategy. Otherwise, that's why they rarely come into power anywhere. Uh, they can identify problems. And they're quite, you know, and, they, and you put it within a anti-neoliberal perspective, and you know, they can make a lot of sense there. But uh, the conclusions they come to quite often are, well, I agree with Jimmy on that score. I, I kind of have to, I have kind of have to hold my nose sometimes when so much of kind of the chuck root stuff about neoliberalism, and I, I read that, and then I read Jagat's piece as well, and. Th Frankly, both of them are trying to insert class wedges inside the SNP to prise apart wee factions. There's no need for either of them to go on and on and on about how there's a class war and how it, it should impact inside the SNP. Frankly, I looked at both of them and thought, plants, both of you. I, I mean, that's their politics. That's where they come from. They've not changed their stance. Well, George certainly hasn't changed his stance. George, did you, Jimmy, do you just accuse uh, George of being a plant? No, I'm accusing George of trying to stir up a class, not a class war, but a classism in the party that doesn't exist. Well, no, and no, I, would suggest, I would suggest I that the only reason he's doing it is to stop the SMP. No, no, no. I'd have to successful. disagree with you there, Jimmy, because there's quite clearly, uh, there's a long list of evidence to suggest that there's things not right at the top of the SMP. No, there's a long list of evidence that you believe. And, and George listed quite a few, a few bits of evidence in his long article. 
And, and then if you're going to, but okay, so you didn't suggest that George was a plant. The question that sometimes uh, the, the defenders of the current <laughs> Nicola Sturgeon way she runs the SNP uh, are very quick to say, oh, you're just, uh, you're a plant, you're just making it easy for unionists. Well, you could turn around that argument and say the cut, there must be people in the top of the SNFP at the moment that are ruining the, our chances of independence, and they must be plants. The, well, the, the problem with a lot of it, mate, is that, I mean, you come out with stuff about careerism and entryism and that, and I agree with you to an extent, but as an example, I've said to you guys in the past, the way that you, particularly people of your age, dismiss young people is offensive. These people have to stand. You're accusing them of entries, and they have to stand as candidates because they've asked for the last 10 years for people to help in some way or other, and none of the parties that run this country are doing anything for people that are younger. You just dismiss them and say, hey, fuck them. They're in their 20s. Let them go home with it because we had it tough. That's not the way to do it. No, I... I don't think that's an accurate picture of my view of what the entryism. I mean, years ago, we're not talking, this isn't recent for me. This was way back 2014, 2013, when it, I first noticed it. We watched the Labour Party destroy itself with entryism, with professional politicians. I think a lot of the faults with the Labour Party came from that professional politician. There was no brickies sitting in Parliament for the Labour Party. When I saw the intake, the 2016 intake for the SNP, it was great. You know, there were professional people, there were managerial class people, there were working class people, some with life experience, some without life experience, but very few professional politicians apart from the well-kent faces. I watched that get diluted with each election that came along where the party apparatchiks, the advisors, etc., started getting in. I don't think that helps the party. I think they should stay as professional managers, not stand for election. There are exceptions to that. My own SMP is an exception to that. There are good people amongst them. You need MSP. MSP, sorry. Okay. Um, there are exceptions obviously they're good people and that's the route the only route they could find to get in it would be nice if we had to start at each election we had to start again and pull people in who had real life experience and it doesn't really matter whether it was in a bank a hospital a plumber's yard or driving a taxi but no, life experience is really important I bet you, I no you, you put your, I put your scene absolutely means that people in their 20s and early 30s can't stand. No, no. I, need, I mean, Mary, had, Mary had, Black... Had a job in a chippy for a few years. Well, Mary Black. You know, Mary Black's I, been a disaster I, since she was elected, mate. All she's, got, all she's got gone for her is a big mouth and a working class accent. So your argument is only my good argument, young people should get no, to stand. No, my argument is that Mary Black's been promoted way above her talent level because she was she had a loud voice and she had Jim Sillers backing. Uh, well, there might be something to be said for that, but I think I mean, she's done some very good stuff. Let's go back to the, the careerist argument. Um, there are two ways to look at it. Look, we first discussed this in 2007. Uh, we, not, not you and I were on the radio then, at least FM, with a brand new of our first ever SNP government which just had just taken control in Holyrood. And we discussed this at the time that now that, that now that the SNP are in government, young people sitting in the universities look thinking about a future career and, and might and might involve politics, they will be joining the SNP, I said at the time. And I certainly yeah. didn't say it was a bad thing at the time, Jimmy. I'm not saying it was. I just said it would be happening, and it has happened. Clearly, has happened. Hey, but young young people, it's particularly in the last decade since the Tories won the election in two thousand and ten, they've hung young folk out to dry. And for the, those ten years, young people have been asking the SNP to help them out in Scotland because the SNP have been in power all of that time. Well, wait, wait, not done enough. Define young people. 
me, anybody between the ages of 16 and 35 is now described as young. Well, sorry, we'll call it 29 because now you can work at the, as from today, as from Sunak's nonsense, you can be 29 and still be on a young person's minimum wage level. So, so basically anybody under 30? Anybody under 30. That, mate, they're standing as candidates now because they've been asking the SNP to bring out specific policies to help them and they've not done it. We could have recreated Sure Start, our own Scottish version. So we you, all say that Sure Start was a wonderful thing and we've done nothing towards that. Wait, just give me a minute here. Stick to the young people thing. So uh, effectively, your argument is that all political parties ignore young people. No, but what I'm saying is they're not doing enough. This COVID thing, young people are the ones that are working in pubs. Young folk are the ones that are working in shops. They're the ones that will lose their jobs and not get them back. What are we doing? Rishi Sunak giving folk a voucher to go and get bloody 50% off their meal next month. And he's paying the employers a £1,000 to create traineeships or okay. £1,000 to create something else. Okay, let, let me do my usual. What percentage of young people vote? Oh, here we go. Nori, it doesn't matter what percentage of young people vote. It They're, does these, these to people, political no, these, parties. These people will be paying for your pension. Give them a hand. It does to political parties. And I would suggest that the political party, especially in Scotland, that gets most of the young people to vote for them is the SNP. Aye, I would agree with that. But they're not doing enough for them. That's why, okay. you're, that's why you're getting people screaming about the Gender Recognition Act. Now, that matters most to the young people because they see that as normality because that's how they live their life. They live with trans people in their, in their community and get on with them fine. They didn't see any difference. And they're being lectured to by people of our age and above. Constant. So the SNP are doing something for them on that? Well, aye, but it's been led by them. It's been well, led by the young people. It's been led by, you know, what do you call them? Young Scots and, for and the SN And the SNP, by your argument, are listening because they're going to introduce it. No, they're not. They've stalled it. Okay. Right. They're going to... Okay. It's there. It's been discussed. All right. Do you really think that that's what most young people are talking about at the moment? No, I don't, but it's just... It's surely it's, it's jobs, a career. I, and what are we doing? We're watching jobs go down the lavvy. We're watching hotel groups fall, falling apart. Right. So if, effectively, what you want is for the SNP to get us independence tomorrow so they can look after the jobs. No, now you're, now you're just being stupid to put one. No, no, on no, no. You know as well as I do, there's bugger all the SNP can do about that without money. So what part uh, of the SNP no, how, policy how much, are they going to take the money from? How, much, how many hundreds of millions do we carry over every year because we have to spend within our budget? We've never mean, once said, we've never once said, see that 240 odd million that we're carrying over this year, we're going to direct it specifically at policies for people between the ages of 16 and 24. You're talking about the so-called underspend. Aye. The contingency fund. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. We can, find use, we can find uses for, we can always find money, mate. Have you, have you known well, the no, we can't Scotland always find bust? money, Jimmy. Have you known the department in Scotland that's went bust in the last 13 years when the SNP have been running? No, because, because they're really quite good yeah. at using the money they've got available yeah, to them. They're, they also have legal restrictions. They're, they're legally bound to do things. The same as councils are legally bound to do things. You know, they have limits. It's to no, convince it, me just, that you have a case, Jimmy, you're going to have to come up uh, with policy that they could enact and haven't. I'm not a policy man, mate. I just react and shout and ball. If you want me to come <laughs> up with a couple of policies, I will do. Well, that, that, that's, I, would, I would find it more yeah. beneficial. Let to, me throw the hand grenade in the middle of this. There is one way, of course, it's that we could achieve Jimmy's aspirations and mine and yours, not in which, of course, is to gain independence in the very near future. There's one argument not been settled about uh, the future economic policy for uh, a first independent Scotland, 
and that is a question of money, the, uh, the currency. And of course, the thing to do is to make sure that the first Scottish government has its own currency, because then they can print the money and support job, like a job guarantee scheme for the young people. No, I, I think that I think some of the thinking on jobs guarantees it's a bit wayward. I like the like Nori, I kinda like the idea some form of universal basic income, but I think we're dragging our heels on that remarkably, given that but it's been talked about in real terms for about five years and we've done what we've not quite got to the point where we've not quite managed to run our own wee schemes and Falkirk or Grangemouth or something like that. The Scottish government, the the Scottish government cannot do it without the OK of Westminster. It's that simple because it affects the whole tax system and we don't control the whole tax system and it affects the whole welfare system, which we don't control. Well, that question, that whole question of the, the, the tax system, they say that was a trap that the SNP government should never have signed up to. Oh. I'm not going back there, Stuart, because I'm sorry. They didn't have How, a choice. I know well, exactly. Choice. So, you know, that was a trap they walked into as a ridiculous statement. They had no choice. They had to take those powers. And look what they've managed to do. Very little, but they've managed to actually blow out the water the idea you can't raise taxes and be popular. They're going to they're going to have to juggle the um, stamp duty thing that they brought in last year again after again Sunak's announcement today because stamp duty effectively and ceases uh, to exist in large parts of the United Kingdom for next Wednesday and the VAT. Aye, that's going to massively affect our budgets, the, the couple of the announcements that he's made today, isn't it? So the position is going to be very interesting. I wonder if they've even taken into account the fact that Scotland was due to take on the VAT. Is it this year? I think it is. Um, I, where are we now? I really June, do wonder oh, if it's right. actually even occurred to Sunak. I think it may have made because the, the stamp duty one in particular stomps all over decisions that we announced last year or earlier this year. Twenty nine absolutely stomps it absolutely stomps all over it because it's what basically they announced. Sorry, because I mean I was watching the stamp duty ceases to exist for about six well, months. Ninety percent of homes in the UK that are sold are less than 500 grand and stamp duty is not going to exist up to 500 grand. That's a new threshold from today. And how much, what's the percentage of stamp duty? We have a higher stamp duty payment in Scotland than England. So uh, we, we, we I would imagine total. what it'll mean is they will compensate the Scottish government to the rate that the English pay for stamp duty so there'll be a wee black hole there uh, there's the going to be a black hole in the stamp duty do. and there's if we've got the vat this year i i don't think we have i think it may be yeah, next but year. I, I think the vat so what's happening with the vat did you say it's cut Vats to five percent from, from on, 20. yes on in hospitality uh, tourism and uh, what was it the other one nori can you remember hotels it's basically, uh, hotel the hospitality yeah. industry has had a 15% cut in VAT. From what I know about the plans for the VAT power transfer to Scotland, it is a bit of a poison chalice because it doesn't give the Scottish government the power to vary it, it's that they just collect it. Yeah, they get to spend it. And the other problem is nobody's been able to tell them what it's worth. So nobody, the British government hasn't told the Scottish government that they'll get a billion pounds a year out of the VAT because they don't differentiate the figures geographically. Aye, deliberately. So nobody <clears> knows <throat> what the price is, what the figure is. It's a bit like Scotland is a year behind with the tax and everything. Mm. You know, they don't really care that, you know, we have to wait on English decisions about things like that. 
they just do it. It'll be interesting to see the mess that's going to be created by this. Aye, um, I think you'll get um, probably not tomorrow, but maybe Friday you'll get Kate Ford coming out in the press and saying, by the way, this is costing X amount of millions to the Scottish budget, so we need some form of recompense. Because you're, you're maybe right, they maybe never factored in just how it would affect Scotland and Wales. They, I, they really don't care. I, I would doubt it even occurred to them. The other interesting one is the so-called Barnet, Barnet consequentials from the money that is going to the entertainment industry <clears throat> is presumed to be the 8.7%. Yeah, but it's not. It's nowhere near but, it. But if you listen to what was actually said... It's going to be targeted at what they, what did they call them? Iconic, like the Albert Hall and places like that. And how many of them sit in Scotland? Ah, exactly. That's not me. I, I had a, look, quick, a quick look at the figures, a cursory look, and we were getting about 6.4% rather than 85 So it wasn't really a consequential at that point. Yeah. I'm, assuming the, I'm assuming they figure if they can get away with that on this one, They'll get away with that on other ones. Well, just, uh, Kenny, Kenny Farkasson tweeted yesterday that it was 97 million due to come to Scotland and it made the 10 million that the Scottish government had put forward look derisory. <clears throat> I didn't tweet him back and say, Kenny, I'll bet you anything you like that we don't get 97 million in consequentials. <laughs> because this is, the, this is a, a Tory PR I think, I think that's the other thing I wanted to say about sat watching the, the Commons on TV, what were the Welsh questions, PMQs, and then sitting there with the Sunak uh, statement. The smug Tory faces because they're spending money. Yeah, they, they, they think they're doing a good job. Well, they they think know. They're going to be elected and be popular back in their. Well, they know they're pumping money into people that give the Tory party money there you go Absolutely. they haven't they really thought about they haven't thought about the fallout it's four years away the next election well these, these four schemes, years away these schemes today are open to all kinds of fraud basically that was the first well, thing you spotted Jimmy wasn't it willing to hand willing to hand employers a thousand pounds if they take on a, an employee another thousand pounds if they take on a in fact I believe a thousand pounds if they two thousand if they take on an apprenticeship thousand pounds for a trainee, a thousand pounds if you take a, a furloughed employee back and pay them till January. The odd one there is if you take them back in October and pay them November, sorry, October, November, December, January, minimum wage is going to cost you about £2,200 and the government are going to give you a grant. So they can take all their furloughed employees back till just after Christmas, bin them, and it's only cost them 1200 quid. That's open to all kinds of fraud. And I've no doubt will be squeezed and used. Is that, mm. that isn't a thousand pounds a month then? That, uh, sorry. A th no, it's a, a one-off payment, a thousand pounds. So it's not an schemes, annual payment? No, there are schemes as well where the government will pay, um, they'll pay the six months wages, of, I believe, trainees, and you get a grant. So there's all kinds of weird schemes, mate. But basically, he reached into a, he reached into his hat the day, and he didn't pull out a rabbit. He pulled out the skin. The rest of the rabbit's still in there, floating about somewhere. Hugely so, complicated. Aye, massively, massively complicated. complicated. And what it wasn't, Norrie, was that expensive. His package basically came to about thirty billion. So it's less than half of what the Scottish government had been lobbying for. There's also the thing that. They're not borrowing this money, and they're not creating this money. Well, they are creating it through the Bank of England. They reckon that it's, the, everything, COVID's going to cost around about three hundred billion. Can't you take a guess at how much quantitative easing the Bank of England's willing to inject into the economy this year? Three hundred billion. Exactly the same. <laughs> Aye. That's a strange coincidence, that one, isn't it? <laughs> Stuart, you have the said a peep for a while oh uh, well you've been talking about uh, something i haven't seen oh right okay the press uh, briefing 
I, th I think we'll possibly be coming back tomorrow with a better idea of Richie Sunak's bailout. Aye, absolutely. Um, well, and we've got a statement. Well, look, to be honest, I, I think I said that, that, that I, I may, maybe we misunderstood when Jimmy announced earlier on that he was going to, he were going to watch this. And I said, oh, you, you know, go ahead. Um, I've given up watching things like the budget. I, I, I treasure my only TV too much. They stand up so smug with big cheers mm. from the supporters behind them. And they, uh, it's always the headlines. You don't actually get to know what they actually said until you sit down afterwards and check it out with the economists and the accountants. Well, I'll, I'll be buying the FT tomorrow. Yeah, there you go. Have a look. Um, Good advice. Nicholas Sturgeon's on the telly at 20 past 12 tomorrow. From All right. Holyrood. For her statement in Holyrood. So do you um, think she'll get as many difficult questions there as she gets from the press? I think what... I think what we'll get is a little bit more politics tomorrow than we've been used to. I do think Jackson Carla will stand up and do his usual, um, oh, we, we are supportive of all your good ideas, but unfortunately they're all bad ideas. <laughs> Nori, how do you think he's going to take um, what is effectively a statement on moving to phase three of lockdown? and managed to twist it quite so much that he gets to talk about them bobags in the lay-by at the weekend, who no, weren't really bobags, and they certainly weren't the racist, and they certainly weren't the xenophobic. The line he'll take is, isn't the Westminster government wonderful giving all you poor Scottish people money? Mm. That's the line he'll take. I do hope he takes that line, and I do hope somebody rams it so far up he's... No, I better not say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, although we didn't really talk about the... Uh, the second list party on independence. I think we'll call that a day. I will get to that tomorrow again, mate. Yeah. It, it won't go away. It's, no, it's, no. It's, I it's gathering it. legs, to be honest. Yeah, it seems to have, have found its way into the mainstream media. Well, anyway. well it kind of needed to, mate. It also kind of needs to, we need to get to a, the point where we're debating it and debating the realities of it because the people behind these parties seem perfectly happy at the moment to hide in the shadows and let. Um, talk about it online they need yeah. to step forward and show us their hands so we can discuss it in reality yeah if, well if they want my vote they're gonna have to come up with manifestos okay guys thanks very much for today and i'll catch you up tomorrow which is not hat friday jimmy tomorrow's thursday mm -hmm. okay I'll, remember I'll, that. I'll probably Tarnation. forget that between now and tomorrow <laughs> and i like your jumper today nori very nice uh Oh, I managed to get it on myself, which I'm having a slight struggle with these days. Is it, a, is it a Christmas jumper? No, no, no. I, I think I got it in a sale. Because <laughs> I'm that age now. I don't buy anything if, unless it's in a sale. You didn't buy anything. Your missus does your shopping for you. Stop pretending. Jimmy, can you imagine me in a three-piece suit with a tip fur on all the time? Because that's all my wife would buy me. <laughs> Aye. No, no. Go, go look like you're about to go to court every day the least, the least version of Peaky Blinders sad, love that Nuri actually I've been accused of looking like Peaky really. Blinders uh, <laughs> not quite I don't think I've ever oh actually I have got a camel coloured duffel coat Aye, and I was imagining you with the uh, you, when you said a tit for well, that's a very English expression for a hat. And I was thinking you with a trilby, you know. Well, it's Courtney Ryan and slam it. slang, isn't it? Tit for tat hat. Right, yeah. 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 indeed. I mean. Okay, guys. Um, I'll catch you tomorrow. Thanks for listening, okay, yeah. folks. Bye bye. And I'll let Stuart get his bye bye in before I, I come I've off. Just it. done it. All right. <laughs> Cheers for now. <laughs>